Hey everybody, welcome back to the My Bourbon Journey Whiskey Review Channel. Uh, welcome to the Mash and Drum Whiskey Review Channel. Doing a little bit of a whiskey collaboration today, uh, sitting down with uh, Caleb, Caleb Kilburn, the uh, master distiller for uh, Peerless Distilling Company. Caleb, thanks for taking some time, appreciate hey, it. Thanks for having me on the, the shows, the I guess. Shows. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. thank you very much. So, I'm, I, I've done interviews before, never two at the same time, so this is, uh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, first. kind of a cool collaborative. Uh, me and Scott have worked together on it with, a, with a few shows that we do a lot together, and uh, we took this time opportunity to want to come talk to you. We figured, hey, let's uh, do it together. So yeah, okay. yeah, it'll be fun today. So so kind of the the idea of today's show is to just get a little bit of information uh, about Caleb, uh, Peerless Distilling itself, and uh, then we're going to do a uh, a quick tasting, and uh, hopefully everybody will uh, will enjoy it. So um, I guess why don't we go ahead and we'll kind of get the the show started. Caleb, if you don't mind, uh, maybe share a little information about yourself and uh, and Peerless Distilling. Okay, so uh, a little bit of, well, about the business first before I factor into it. Um, Peerless, even though it's a fairly new product, it's something that these guys have reviewed fairly recently, uh, it's actually the rival of a really old one. So Peerless was owned and operated from 1889 until 1917, and it shut down as part of the Food and Lever Act. Uh, basically, it was uh, wartime measures to conserve grain. It was more important to feed people than it was to uh, make whiskey in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, the Peerless Distilling Company was owned and operated by a man named Henry Craver, and when the distillery shut down, even though he couldn't produce any more whiskey, he actually uh, was able to continue selling uh, everything he had aging in his warehouse, and even in the prohibition under a medicinal spirits license. Uh, that being said, without production of new whiskey to replenish his stores, eventually he ran out. When he ran out, they turned the lights off, everyone went home, they shut down the business. Uh, but rather than selling it off to anyone else or a bigger distillery, it simply laid dormant. It laid dormant within the family for 98 years until the Ridge Runner's great-grandson, Corky Taylor, mm -hmm. decided to self-fund, rebuild the distillery here in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, we, start, we purchased the building in 2013, uh, we underwent extensive renovation because it was a old dilapidated warehouse for uh, lack of a better term yeah. uh, it's a building with a lot of rich history it's over 130 years old uh, and it showed in early construction because yeah. <laughs> uh, we basically had to demolish things to the skeleton and then rebuild from there but what resulted at the end was a uh, building and a business that is both rich in history and has a ton of character so we started distilling in 2015 we released our first product a uh, Kentucky straight rye in 2017 that was met with a lot of really good reviews. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, and okay. uh, <laughs> uh, as well as uh, quite a number of awards. Uh, that product that fall was awarded number 15 Whiskey in the World by Whiskey Advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, we went on forward uh, with a, a three-year product the following year. Uh, reason you'll notice as the distillery grows older, our products will. Mm -hmm. We made the decision early on everything you get from Kentucky Peerless is made in-house. We don't do any outsourcing, no contracts or shell games. It's uh, it's all, if it has our label on it, it came out of that still. But yeah, we uh, released the uh, three-year rye. Uh, we were able to win uh, Forbes Magazine number four whiskey, mm -hmm. uh, American Whiskey with that one, an article written by uh, Fred Minnick. Yep. Uh, this, uh, past, uh, this past March, actually, uh, we accepted the award for the Global Craft Producer of the Year, uh, awarded by Whiskey Magazine, uh, Global Icons of Whiskey. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a massive honor for us. So um, that's kind of the revival story of Kentucky Peerless. Uh, my personal journey to here, uh, where, where I intersected the brand, uh, <laughs> I grew up on a dairy farm. So uh, I grew up around secondary process, piping, mechanical systems, uh, really a lot of the same technologies that go in place in a distillery. I just learned it from the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really uh, interesting. So it was uh, kind of the perfect storm. Uh, growing up, I loved sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and when I went to college, I was actually uh, taking the groundwork to where I could have majored in any one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, uh, while I was still in school and while I was still undecided, I fell in love with distilling. Mm -hmm. uh, not from a drinking perspective. If I was a goody two-shoes, I didn't have to drink. <laughs> I, I wasn't one of these that I, I didn't drink before I was 21, and I didn't drink much after I was 21. Yeah. It took a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I fell in love with the science of the process and everything I'd learn would uh, both reinvigorate this uh, desire to get into the industry as well as just this thirst for knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so I started going out, started shadowing different people, learning from everyone I could. And uh, I was actually able to work my way into a few apprenticeship type positions. Mm -hmm. 
And those people who were mentoring me kind of played matchmaker with the uh, ownership of Kentucky Peerless. Because it was, uh, it was while I was still in college, I uh, told them I wanted to go out, I wanted to learn, and they sent me to a distillery design under construction called Kentucky Peerless. Hmm. So I came here, I started out with construction crew, sawing and stacking lumber, moving boards, shoveling gravel, whatever it took. Uh, you, you'll actually notice some of the woodwork around the fermenters where we framed up the decking around them. I was responsible uh, <laughs> for assisting in that. So you have your, you have your thumbprint a little bit everywhere. Oh, know, yes. Yeah. There, there, <laughs> A lot of the people here, see, we didn't uh, hire an architectural firm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we uh, we did just enough for uh, blueprints and drawings, but as far as the actual nuances, uh, how everything flows together, process, uh, that was all done in-house. Uh, it's something we're very proud of, and uh, that kind of all-under-this-roof mentality uh, goes for everything from the product to the package was designed in-house. We didn't hire a firm for that. Um, very personal. Yes, Very personal. Yeah. yes, yes. We uh, we like having a thumbprints on the product. So yeah, I uh, I started working with Carson Corky. I kept grabbing up responsibilities during the construction process because again, I did it in the dairy. I was familiar with the processes, how it all needed to work, and uh, even though I was easily the youngest guy on the job site, I was the one who was gung ho enough to convince all these engineers and people that I was the one who needed to take lead on all these uh, these different tasks. So it was just kind of one of those matches made in heaven. Yeah, yeah. very, very yeah, interesting. Stars kind of aligned on that one. Yep. Yeah, it really did. Yeah. How, well, how to go from dairy farming to transitioning to distilling? How was that transition for easy. you? Easy. Really? See, uh, when you think about a dairy farm, it's not a 40-hour-a-week job. It's not a uh, uh, five, uh, five-day-a-week. five It's not, uh, oh, you get holidays and vacations, like Cows don't care if it's cold. It doesn't care if it snows. It doesn't care if it's <laughs> Memorial Day. Yeah. Uh, they have to be milked two or three times a day no matter what. Yeah. Uh, they still need fed. They still yeah. need uh, medical attention. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, you're tied to it. It is your life. So uh, when I started uh, distilling, it's like, there's time off. Yeah. You, you don't, you, you, what, what, is, what is this like? And yeah. it was actually a huge uh, cultural issue for me early on because yeah. I didn't know what to do with myself for free time. <laughs> it, it, no, seriously, it, yeah. it took me forever I, I to actually could, yeah. figure out, like, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, what do I do? Yeah. Two days off? Well, I guess I, I, had, I had one question. I know you were just recently named uh, Master Distiller. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. My thought behind that was what. What does that mean to you in the overall aspect of things? Well, for background, when I started, I was early stages of construction. They went ahead and say, oh, you can be a distiller, a distiller. Uh, But then after they saw that I really just took things over and uh, uh, was rather driven as far as how I wanted things set up, uh, they uh, titled me head distiller. And that is what we agreed on because... Uh, the term master floated around, and I was quick to shut that down. Mm. See, uh, my heroes are master distillers. Mm-hmm. Like that's that to me. That's not a position within the distillery. That's a position within the industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, uh, there was no way in the world, and I, I still don't know that I deserve the same title. But there, at that time, for sure, I didn't deserve the title the same as like Jimmy Russell and Jim Rutledge. Like those, those, those are the guys. Right. Right. And so I. Uh, when I had it, we went through as head distiller. We won these awards. Uh, as Peerless began to g- gain notoriety, as uh, I am not comfortable with praise. I'm yeah. not comfortable with the <laughs> steam or anything like that. But I became higher profile. Um, and uh, it actually completely blindsided me when they made the transition because um, basically what had happened, there was enough industry pressure. It was like, come on, just just go ahead. Just, 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 just do it. Like, we get it. Like, um, humility, all that, that's great, but seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so it was actually at the Christmas uh, Christmas party. It was actually at Corky's house because Beryl's is a big family, and mm-hmm. we're very family-oriented. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I was sitting there, and uh, I thought they just happened to invite Mom and Dad to surprise me. I, I was naive. Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend was there. <laughs> you didn't know what was coming, did you? Well, they didn't know it was coming either. Okay. They, they just said... Hey, why don't you all come to the Christmas party? And mom and dad are good time and folks, so sure. Uh, no more dairy. Uh, yeah, so, no more dairy. Yeah, no so more they, dairy. they were tied to the dairy in excess of 20 years. So wow. now that they're free from that, they're enjoying life. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I was sitting there and um, 
uh, maybe about like 30 seconds before it happened, I was like, something's up, everyone's looking at me. Uh, and that's when they brought out this big package. Corky made a little speech, and I opened it, and I still didn't know what was in it. And then when I opened it, I was like, it, it, you'll, you'll see it when you go outside. Yeah. I'm sure you can put a, dub a picture in. Sure. It was this big stainless steel plaque where it said, Caleb Kilburn, Master Distiller. And uh, I looked at it, and then I cried. Because <laughs> uh, it, cause it, 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 I mean, it, it's a dream. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there's yeah. no other way to describe it. I'm blessed to be living my dream. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. uh, it, it's good to it's good to see you, you know, people in the whiskey industry that are living their dreams doing this. It's not just a job; it's way more than that. And yeah. between you talking to Corky downstairs, mm -hmm. the family aspect of what you're building here, what you built already, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, that was that was one of the things I appreciated all along with with what you guys uh, really had going on. That was very uh, family oriented, and you could tell that that there was no like, you know you're my boss, you know, you're my boss, you tell me to do this, that it was just very much everybody was hands-on, you know, you all were willing to, to do... Whatever. Boss is a dirty word around here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At one time, uh, one of the employees who was fairly new, uh, there, his family came in to uh, walk through the facility and check it out, and he introduced Corky as his boss, and Corky shut it down immediately. <laughs> He's like, you work with me, you don't work for me. Hmm. And, and that's something that's... Uh, it, it's carried through the whole company culture, and what it's done is it's allowed everyone to take the same the same passion I have about distilling yeah. is the same passion that our retail staff has about tourism, yeah. the same uh, passion that our single barrel curator has about making picks and uh, working with different accounts. I mean, everybody top to bottom, they show up to work and they are passionate about what they do, and that that's a testament to the leadership of Corky Taylor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it filters down. You can see from the leadership all the way down to the way the building was designed, all the way down to, as you mentioned, to the bottle design. Yeah, and absolutely. you guys did that in house, yeah. and it's such an like, iconic bottle. I mean, that thing yeah. sticks out on the shelf. It's I yeah. love that bottle. Yeah, when you see it, you know that's yeah, that's one hundred percent peerless. <laughs> you know, rye, but now transitioning into bourbon. Here yes, real soon. So yeah, under a month now. It's uh, the. I uh, I use this analogy the other day because everyone asks like, are you excited? How's it feel? What what's going through your mind? Uh, you know how out in the west, how you'll be driving, you see a mountain, off in the distance, and you think, okay, it, it, yeah. it's forever away, and you drive closer, and it doesn't feel any closer. You drive closer, it doesn't feel any closer, yeah. and all of a sudden, it's just on you. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's how it is with bourbon. <laughs> it's, it, it's, bourbon yeah. it's been that landmark that's been way off in the distance for so long yeah. that it's almost a suspension of belief now that we're close to it. Yeah. And uh, we're, don't get me wrong, we're ready. We're, I'm proud of the product that we're going to put out. It's uh, still nerve-wracking, though. It, it's, I can imagine. Because it's here. Yeah. yeah, especially releasing a bourbon into a, a market flooded with bourbons. You really want your I don't know if it's and... flooded. I think it's... Uh, Adequately supplied. <laughs> because supplied. Because yeah, yeah. I'm yet to hear an enthusiast walk to the shelf and say, "Man, there are just too many. Too, <laughs> this, this, this is too much. This I, is too much. I, I don't, I don't yeah. like all this. We we just need to go back to having like yeah. make like 20 brands tops. Like oh, I'm done. I, That's I mean, a very good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. So until that happens, I think that we can keep going. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. Do, do you uh, do you mind sharing the reason for why the bourbon will be released on June 22nd? Uh, I think it ties back to Henry Craver's birthday, okay. yep. uh, which was uh, June, I think, 23rd, actually. But okay. uh, that's a Sunday, so we bumped it up a day. 22nd, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. It took me a minute. I, I, I'm a distiller, not a marketer. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, yeah, so June 22nd, the bourbon will be hitting the market. And yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. You guys yeah. having a big release party for it? So that Saturday, we are uh, going to open the doors. Uh, we're expecting quite the turnout, so uh, we're actually not going to do tours that day, uh, but we're going to offer tastings on the half hour, so 10.30, 11.30. Uh, we'll be happy to welcome anybody and everybody. Yeah. I know myself and Carson and Corky are all going to be here. Good. And uh, I'm just so excited for people to see a whole new uh, whole new side of Kentucky yeah. Fearless. Yeah. Are, are you... Are you very excited because this is a little bit of a, a baby kind of project for you that you're releasing to the world kind of. I mean, from a standpoint of like, I've got my my imprint really on this. Oh, no, that no, that no, no it's not a not a me thing at all. I'm okay. I'm very much a process oriented person. Oh, I, yeah. uh, like they'll tell you else run the story like I can barely enjoy things for wanting to like drive it to perfection and yeah. uh, that's why myself and Carson and Corky all get along I mean it, if there's a 
if the bottle isn't printed just absolutely perfect, it drives Carson Corky crazy, and it, it does me too. Uh, it actually works out pretty good because I get to use them as the scapegoats for my own OCD. <laughs> like, like I'll come through and I'll be like, "Man, Corky's not going to like this. He he probably won't. He will never notice it in my life." But I'm like, "Man, Corky, uh, like he, he's going to want this straight." So I get to throw them under the bus on a lot of my OCD ticks. Also, oh, that's that's good. That's, that's not good. your fault. That's, that's your fault. Not mine. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. He, uh, he he's real particular. Like I'm on your team, man. But, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But for, for, for him, you got to do this. Yeah. 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 Well, do we want to uh, get into a little bit of a tasting here and kind uh, of uh, absolutely, yeah. Let's, yeah. Uh, let's can, talk about the, what yeah. let's got. talk about what we're uh, here to taste and okay. the whiskey. So, uh, one of the things that we love about whiskey is the variations. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the small batch, that's somewhat mitigated. In that, I'm going to be selecting six barrels that I'm going to be trying to pull toward a central profile. That way, when you get a uh, small batch of Kentucky Peerless, it's not always going to be identical, but it's going to be similar. Uh, it's going to be uh, composed of barrels from the far reaches of the flavor wheel. That way, what comes together is going to be balanced, but it's going to have representation from all around. So it's going to be a very vi- diverse flavor profile. That's going to be the first sample you're tasting. But as we go through and we're grading barrels to put together that small batch, we're going to find ones that need to be their own product. Like They're just awesome, unique Easter egg barrels that are going to showcase notes and flavors that are just way out there. Mm-hmm. But they're, they're just so cool. You, I mean, you can't yeah. pass it up. Yeah. Um, and, and this is where it actually gets interesting. Uh, whiskey geeks, uh, they'll concede, yeah, the small batch is probably the more technical, solid, balanced product, but the single barrels are where you have fun. Yes. And so it, it just shows you that there is all these differences within whiskey, and it can all be good. Yeah. There, there's yeah. not a uh, better or worse. It's just... It's just different. Yeah, and that's yeah. the beauty of single barrels. Yeah. I mean, you just you just get to mess around and look at this profile. Someone's yeah. going to love this. Yeah. You know someone's yeah. going to love it. So yeah, that's the, what I really like, the the idea that you you attach a name. There's there's something yes. that you can like uh, kind of you know put in the back of your mind that maybe you'll get influenced by this flavor of this. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and uh, the bulk of our single barrels are actually not sold here. It, it, the ones in the gift shop are just uh, drops in the bucket. The bulk of the single barrels are actually shared to our retail partners. Those are the people uh, who are going to be carrying it at your local store who are going to be uh, really the main purveyors of the Peerless single barrels. But we are proud of the selections that we have up front as well, and that's yeah. really where we pilot the program and where we can show people the range that they can expect when they go to their local store. Absolutely. So with that in mind, we have one called Orange Blossom, mm-hmm. one named Bright Eye, and then we have a Double Oak Burrow. And I'll explain double oak a little bit when we get a little bit closer. All right, I'm excited for that one. So without further ado, let's start with the small batch. Absolutely. That nice nice spice right away, that little vanilla undertone to it. It has such a perfect balance of sweet and and rye spice. It really does. I even get like like a little herbaceous quality. Yeah. It always surprises me just how much... Uh, of like kind of like that fruit and floral portion of the flavor, mm-hmm. well, more so floral in this one. Um, yeah. So depending on the audience you're talking to, um, you can't go super super uh, high brow or snooty with your tasting. Notes. Yeah, of course. Because yeah. yeah. I always equate it to food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, which helps. Yeah. yeah, but even then, you'll have people who'll be like. Yeah, I believe it's a dried apricot that's yeah. been toasted a little. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, that, yeah, that kills I, me. Like, that like, kills like, me. like a, a yeah. broil, oven broiled apricot. I, I don't know what that <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, even if I did that, I don't know that I know <laughs> what it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, when I discuss uh, botanicals are one of the hardest ones in the world to quantify because uh, people recognize honeysuckle. Other than that, it... it it's yeah. they'll, they'll re- maybe recognize rosemary, maybe yeah. uh, Christmas tree, but that, that's about it as far yeah. as that portion of the flavor with them. So to actually describe just like bright, brilliant florals or botanical stuff like that, if I don't say floral and they don't get that, if I say botanical, they don't get that. I'll say garden center. Just go to the garden center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk into a greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're good. It, it's there. You're good. It almost has like this. I get a nice honey note to it too. Like that. I was, I was gonna say like burnt honey. Like it, it like there's something yeah, caramelized yeah, to it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Very toasty. Mm-hmm. Uh, toasty. Shall we taste? Yes. Yeah, this is cheers. Yeah, awesome on the nose. Mm. No, this is a good batch. I mean, they're they're all good batches, but uh, <laughs> I, I I taste so many single barrels. 
sometimes I forget to go back and actually just taste and appreciate, and appreciate my small the batch. small batch. Because, again, it, it should have all that balance. And yeah. I think that shows through that it, it's almost schizophrenic as far as the flavors that you get right off the bat. Yeah. It leads sweet, then it goes like orange yeah. zest, and it's like cinnamon, and yeah. it's like you, um, orange. Orange yeah. cinnamon is one you, I remember. You kind of almost nailed that, that one as though you were the master distiller for oh. your distiller. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, very, very kinda, good, very good descriptor. That's so, why you actually know yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, there's a reason for that. Yeah, yeah, very good, very <laughs> fantastic. And then it just kind of, when you go back and you taste it the second time, it gets earthier. Now you've got these accents of like a like a dry cocoa. You have like a little bit of like a tobacco, uh, like dried tobacco. Yeah. The first time I tasted your three year uh, immediately was orange, cinnamon, and chocolate. Yeah, so amazing yeah. that you said that, and that was, yeah. I mean, especially on the finish. But it's amazing how floral the nose is, and when it, when it kind of comes in, you hit it, kind of hits your mid palate there. You get that that floral aspect too, that herbal quality. Yeah. But then the finish is just orange spice, caramel yeah. notes. It it's, really does. It's, it's it hits amazing. All, all those. And then you get that beautiful senses. sweet oak as well. Yeah. And I think this is a good time for me to talk about that sweet mash and these different things. Yeah. Because really, as we were sitting down, well, really, me, when I was sitting down <laughs> uh, and trying to figure out where we wanted this to go. Mm-hmm. Um, what I really wanted to create was something that was balanced. So many ryes go all in on pepper, or they'll go all in on oak, and then they kind of poorly develop the other portions of the flavor wheel. Um, that, that, that's just uh, something that belongs to the category, and why in bulk most people um, who maybe aren't familiar with rye or not deep into tasting whiskey yet will say, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a rye drinker, I don't yeah. like rye. It's too spicy, too this, too that. Um, too many twos. <laughs> so, um, so if you have a sour mash product, uh, when you distill it to keep that soured, gritty taste to make it, for, keep it from making it into the final distillate, you have to strip it out. So you have to distill at a higher proof, which is gonna create a higher proof distillate and a more neutral distillate. So it's stripping out that. But there's also some collateral damage. It's gonna strip out some of the grain character. It's gonna strip out some of that fermentation character, which often come across as herbaceous and floral. Uh, well, I want those characteristics. So we go ahead and we do a sweet mash. So starting fresh corn, fresh rye, fresh barley, and a first generation yeast that we use one time. Mm. So it's a very expensive process, but what it does for us is it allows me to distill at a low proof, maximizing my grain content, the florals, the, herb, the herbs, uh, helps with grain character, uh, well beyond grain character, mouthfeel, and Here's a big one uh, that a lot of people don't think of when you first do this. If I distill at 130 proof as opposed to 145 proof, mm-hmm. I have less water addition to get it to my barrel entry. Mm-hmm. If I distill at a high proof, it's going to start off more neutral and I have to dilute, add more water to it. So it's mm-hmm. kind of a double edged it, it's not a double edged sword, it's two swords facing the same direction. You get <laughs> yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, you get more flavor and you have to dilute it less by yeah. distilling a lower proof. Yeah. So that's the ideology behind sweet mash. Uh, sweet floral beer, it's expensive to make. You have to be very uh, dedicated to cleaning a lot. Uh, you have to have very sanitary conditions. Yeah, uh, but if Corky you, mentioned that downstairs, yeah. how the cleaning process that, mm-hmm. you guys, that you guys do, you're very proud of it. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're kind of sacrificing... Well, you're not man actually sacrificing... Yeah, you're sacrificing man hours, but... The, the quality that's going back into the product, you're maximizing your grain, your flavors. Yes. You know, at the even though we it's make more the expensive. most of what even we have, even though yeah. it's more expensive. And that's a and you're doing what's right. That's going to be a consistent thing. Yeah. 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 Um, so we come off the still low proof, and this is where we uh, do our next big difference. Uh, so the sweet mashing, that's actually a break from tradition. But this next step, where we go into the barrel, uh, that's where we're actually going to go very old school. See. Uh, hundred years ago when you were having a bourbon or a, well not a hundred years ago because of prohibition but mm-hmm. let's go back a little further than that 120 years ago yeah uh, when you were doing a bourbon or a rye you had to go in a barrel below 110 proof reason being that was what was deemed to make a full and robust whiskey okay uh, a lot of flavor and back then the barrels primary unit of sell so much of this was consumed at or near barrel proof mm-hmm. Uh, so there's very little water added. There wasn't chill filtration. It was just full, robust whiskey. Yep. Uh, as I mentioned, when you got around to the 60s and whiskey was hurting, uh, they had to find a way to make it lighter flavored, more economical. And the way they did that was they bumped that barrel entry proof from 110 up to 125. Uh, and basically what that does for you is 
when you store whiskey concentrated, you don't have to buy as many barrels, build as many warehouses, provide as much flavor. And then at the end of the day, you just add unflavored water to it to dilute the flavors, dilute the characteristics, and really spread it out. Mm -hmm. Now, see, if you've got uh, 200 bottles worth of uh, barrel proof at 125 and you proof it to 80, you've got 300 barrels. Yeah. Yeah. Or 300 bottles. 300 yeah. bottles. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a 50% increase in volume, which is great from a uh, financial perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but when, say you're drinking Coca-Cola, if you're drinking a, uh, if you're drinking a 12 ounce Coke and I dump six ounces of water in on top of it, is it going to taste as full and robust and true as the original Coke? Hell no. Yeah. No, it, it, if you're in a restaurant and your ice melts more than just a little bit, you're like, can I have another? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a minor addition. You got mm -hmm. to think 50% increase, it's going to cut the florals, the grains, the process, the, yeah, everything. It yeah. so much flavor yeah. out of it. When the, when the alcohol leaves that barrel, it is going to be as concentrated in flavor as it is ever going to be. Yeah. So, yeah. And you could taste it in, in Yeah, you absolutely yeah. can. We were just talking yeah, about yeah. that downstairs before about the, the lower entry proof yeah. and, and not having to cut it and... and everybody nowadays really appreciating that when you get a whiskey it's what you produced it's yes. not it's not what was in the barrel and then you're adding a percentage of water now the flavor profile has completely changed no you know we're getting what it is that you're yeah. producing for that reason so yeah we go and proof down on the front end we allow uh the water that is added to proof the whiskey mm -hmm. It actually enhances the maturation. It doesn't uh, take away from it. Mm -hmm. So by adding the water on the front end, what it's gonna do is it's gonna make it a much better uh, extractor of the caramels, the vanillas, and things like that while leaving behind the more oily yeah. uh, tannics. Yeah. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna pull off a very sweet, very, uh, very spice-oriented barrel, uh, not a very tart or peppery uh, barrel. Yeah, and, and um, you could you could taste that just being mm -hmm. the, even when you release the first two year yep. uh, yeah. bottle, that did not smell or taste like a two year old no, rye. No, no, not at all. That you would have thought that that could have been aged at least six seven years. Yeah. Well, it's actually fun. We we would go into a lot of uh, blind taste testings, mm -hmm. and we would just sit back and would giggle because <laughs> yeah. I mean it's like yeah, yeah. nope. You just told us that we are older than that eight or ten year old product. Yeah, and that was a consistent thing that happened pretty regularly. I, I could see that. I mean, even even yeah. amongst you know when you know Scott was talking yeah. about it when he did his review on it, it's like this does not taste two years old. No, yeah, no. So to uh, give you the specifics though, so we go in the barrel at 107 proof. Mm -hmm. At the end of maturation, almost everything is between 108 to 110. Uh, we do have some that dip lower, some that dip higher, uh, and it's nothing that we change or we offer. It's just a natural process. Yeah, it's Mother Nature. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we mature the whiskey with the water. Uh, the water is going to have the benefit of pulling out the flavors and maturing with the whiskey. At the end of the day, uh, it's the same product that you get in the bottle that I go into the warehouse and taste. Uh, there's no water added, no chill filtration. Um, I didn't even talk about chill filtration. Yeah. I, or, yeah. How do you all feel about that? Very strongly. Very strongly. And we're strongly in the in the in yeah. the. You're very pro it, right? We are very pro non chill filter. Okay. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think yes, yeah. yeah pro it from from a standpoint of yeah, no, no, yeah. from a, from the standpoint of not yeah. stripping those fatty acids or the impurities that yeah. you know we feel you know that. You know, by, oh, heck, it, by it, a, it isn't an impurity. It's what you're. It's the flavor or the flavor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you. Uh, I assume you like steak. I do uh, like steak. Yes. Do you, is uh, is it great if you have a uh, beautiful marble uh, with fats and these things that are contribute to mouthfeel? Is a steak that has a good marbling or just no fat at all going to be better? Hands down, one with fat in it. Marbling. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Like you, the the fat is where you're going to have your flavor, where you're going to have yeah. your mouthfeel. Like that is the flavor and character yeah. of that steak. Much the same that. Uh, those fats, oils, lipids are going to be the character within whiskey. Yeah. It's where you're going to get your mouth feel. When you strip it out, um, I, b I believe uh, Colesveen over at Willett said it best, it lobotomizes the whiskey. It just takes yeah. all character away from it. It really does. I mean, I, I get the idea of them doing it, you know, whoever it may be. Yeah, that and, like, you know, somebody who may want an absolutely consistent product or something along those lines. But, you know, from the standpoint of being able to put out a product that is non-chill filtered, barrel proof or whatever it may be from that standpoint you're you're getting a full flavored whiskey and and nowadays like we were talking about the other day about 
it doesn't always have to be high proof in order to get all that long finish. But I think a lot has to do with the non-chill filtration mm -hmm. that it's leaving all of that in there. Yeah. So it's yeah. allowing your mouth to be coated and, yeah. and all those flavors. Yeah, and, I, and I've been saying, I'd rather have a, a lower proof whiskey that's non-chill filtered than a high proof whiskey that is chill filtered. Yeah, absolutely. Well, to, to, let's just back up for a minute, explain chill filtration. So when you are uh, proofing whiskey down, when you add water to it, what's gonna happen is some of the fat oils and lipids now aren't gonna be quite as stable in solution. Minor cases of this can be where whiskey just turns a little bit cloudy. No big deal, they're slightly out of suspension, they're basically suspended within the whiskey. But again, it's flavorful. Uh, usually this will occur if you put it in the fridge or the freezer. Uh, if you put an ice cube in, sometimes that can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's no big deal. It, it's there, it's flavorful, just trust me. Uh, extreme cases of it though, where you've added an extreme amount of water or underwent a huge shift in proof, uh, it's gonna start coagulating. And for it's gonna look like there's a dust bunny in your whiskey for lack yeah. of a better term. It's a <laughs> process called flocking. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though there's nothing wrong with your whiskey, it is not spoiled, that stuff is very flavorful. Don't, don't get grossed out because it's not very good at the consumer level for this to happen. What what you do, uh, what the industry practice is, is to go ahead and induce this in the plant. You go and chill the whiskey down. You get it cold enough to where you force that flocking uh, well below temperatures that it'll ever see uh, in North America. <laughs> well, upper North America. I, 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 your clientele, you, uh, you're going to see those temperatures. Let me rephrase. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. I'm from, we don't see those temperatures. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll go and cool it down. They force this coagulation. They filter it out, and then they serve a beautiful pristine, crystal clear, not, I mean, it's going to be amber, um, but yeah. there's going to be free of anything in it that could be perceived as a solid. Beautifully colored. Uh, it's not going to have a whole lot of character though. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you, you may notice some whiskeys, uh, particularly after been tasted in a while, uh, you can almost immediately tell whether a whiskey has been chill filtered or not. Uh, when you go, when you taste, when you sense it, uh, if it's watery, if it's uh, got poor mouthfeel, if you've got a a lot of solvent notes um, that it's been chill filtered. The mouth, the oh, mouth yeah. fill on is really the, yeah. the one then aspect the, I get that's that you know very away. very yeah. early on that yeah. oily viscous feel in your mouth. That's why I think you know a, a lot of people don't describe mouth feel very often in, yes. in reviews, and I think it's extremely important for people to understand what that whiskey feels like in your mouth yes. because you know trying to explain something to to someone that it's that it's thin or oily or viscous or whatever it may be becomes a very good descriptor of what it is you're about ready to taste. Well, I've gotten to the point, I'll be honest, I've ruined myself when it comes to product that's usually uh, low 90s and down uh, yeah. just because it tastes watery. Like I, I, I get to it uh, same way we were talking about Coke a minute ago where yeah, right, right. as soon as it begins to not be full, as soon as I perceive that it is not as concentrated in flavor as it should be, mm -hmm. I, I just I, yeah, I can't it, do it. It doesn't ruins it for you yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You do kind of get spoiled once you're, you know, drinking something like you're producing, and you know what that flavor is and what you want it to do, and, yes. and all of that. That it's hard to go the other direction to something that's thin, lower proof, doesn't have a lot of flavor. I mean, and chill filter. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And what's really fun? I, I mean, all, everyone always asks, what What do you drink when you go out? I, I, varieties of spice of life. I like to see what all's out there and kind of gauge the gauge the crowd. And uh, usually, I don't reach for uh, just base level products. Usually, I want to see what other uh, nuances they can come up with. Or uh, I love tasting different craft products. And almost always, I, I can find a product that's amazingly distilled. It's just often overproofed or chill filtered, mm -hmm. and and that's it just breaks my heart because I can see like I can see the distillation skill, like I can yeah. see how good that whiskey came out of the barrel, and then some other stuff happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and, yeah. and speaking on that, I, I did a review. I won't name the brand or anything, but I did a, a review not long ago of an eighty proof uh, bourbon non chill filtered that was both a rye and wheat mash bill blend, mm -hmm. and and I knew immediately that with even though it was 80 proof the non-chill filter had everything to do with that being to me more of a quality product yep something that i think 
more people truly want. They may not know they want that, mm -hmm. but if you tasted an 80 proof chill filtered versus an 80 proof non-chill, um, it was night and day. And I think mm -hmm. it was just, it, it, you know, I wish people understood more about really what, what that, that process is and what it allows the... Well, here's the thing. Do. You're not wishing that people knew. You're doing something about it. We yeah. are. We are. We are. That's, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. that's, that's yeah. why I appreciate people yeah. such as yourselves actually uh, working to educate the consumer base. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how we continue to drive quality. That's how we shift the market toward higher quality spirits and continue to build um, on the reputation as bourbon's good name. Yeah. Well, speaking of great whiskey, how about we get Okay, okay. I, I, I told you I'd go back to the quality <laughs> stuff. I apologize for delaying the drink. Oh, no, let's no, no, let's no, get, no, let's get no. back I, to the I think it's don't, great. Like you, like you said, I think it's great for people to understand not only about your products, but to understand processes. I mean, yeah. a lot of people are interested, and, and they may not even know that they are, but it's good to be able to give this information to people so that they really yeah. truly understand. I mean, you understand yeah. what's going into the whiskey. Absolutely. What's uh, what what the mindset is behind it, mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. It just gives people much more of appreciation of what they're what they're drinking yeah. and, and you know why they're spending the money on that particular bottle of a specific whiskey. It's because of the, the process and the care and the love that you're putting into it. So right. and we and we see that, we just want more people to see it. Hey, we're working on it. Right, we're working yep. on it. Yeah. Okay. So the next single barrel we have again, these should be pretty darn different. Okay. Uh, that, let me rephrase. I know they're going to be very different. <laughs> okay. I picked them. Yeah, um, I was so, going to say, you know better yeah, yeah. than we do. <laughs> so the first one is going to be named Orange Blossom. Okay. That should be a. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. Just try. It. All right. All right. Cheers. To leaving it up Cheers. to. Uh... Oh boy. Yeah, that floral citrus note. I don't know if it's maybe because you put the word orange in my head. But yeah. It definitely has an orange blossom type aspect well, to it. A blood orange. Yeah, that's a very good description. Oh, I said I'll give you the name. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep them out. Okay. Hmm. I, I, the one thing I like about your stuff is where the, where the spice hits, right in that mid palate mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. You know, it just sits there. But again, all that sweetness is coming in on yeah. the finish. Get mm -hmm. that beautiful herbal Cinnamon, quality up yeah. front. Yeah. That floral. Floral. Yeah. But there, there's, yeah. There's, there's a little bit more of a citrus note on this one yeah. I was getting yeah. on your small batch. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, nice cinnamon. And that's, this is actually an excellent uh, dissection where you can see how a barrel like this contributes to the small batch mm -hmm. um, while obviously showcasing its own individual qualities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the name Orange Blossom. Uh, we were particularly fond of the, some very nice florals, some very nice woody notes, um, and then of course I had a very nice uh, citrus, uh, almost like a creamy citrus. Yeah, like that. yeah. Well, we talked last night. We had some stuff, and it was like a, that orangeicle. It's that, that vanilla creamsicle, creamy vanilla creamsicle. Creamsicle. Yeah, you're getting that in here. And too. again, kind of yeah. the standard profile. I've always noticed uh, when you get into your second and third sips, and then you raise the nose and take one more sip, it shifts very earthy the further it goes yeah. now so it picks up like some subtle tobacco like some subtle brown, burnt like burnt sugar yeah mm -hmm. not like caramel like burnt sugar like brulee and i still get this like long lingering citrus that wants to just kind of sit there as well for me one thing i like about peerless and one thing i really judge a good whiskey on is consistency from sip to sip and i'm not yeah. i and i don't mean flavor wise you get different flavors as you, as yeah. you taste different whiskeys yeah but i mean i want to I still want that burst of flavor. I want it to stick around, and I want that finish to remain long, strong. And yeah. yeah. The yeah. way I describe it, I I love for my flavor profile to vary. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I'd be mm -hmm. to, it's like a Wizard of Oz, the horse. Like I, I'm fine with it going all through different yeah. colors, yeah. everything else, showing yeah. different expressions. But I always want to be consistent in quality. Exactly. So, I, and that's that's. that's what we do here in our single barrels, and you could you could taste it. I mean, it, it's one of those ever evolving. Uh, yes, yeah, the layers, the, the layers, layers of flavor really that come through. Yeah. You're just gonna find new things each time you sip it, yeah. and that's that's the beauty of um, of the Peerless product. Without further ado, let's move on to. Uh, oh, you want to swish? Okay, right. we can swish. We'll swish a little bit. <laughs> Water break. This one is uh, creatively named Rye Thai, and again, oh, that's completely different. Wow. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, I'm not, okay, I can't keep my mouth shut on this one. This, <laughs> this is this is, uh, this is probably one of the most unique ones I've found. Yeah, it's very it's very like rye bold. It's very very bold, oaky. Rum. Nice. This is all nice sassafras. Caramel. You say rum? Yeah, oh. rum's yeah. what I got. Too. Rum, sassafras, root beer yeah. type. Yeah. Uh, oh, my goodness. goodness. Up that it, it, it was, and again, nothing's different about any one of these barrels. There, yeah. it's not like in different parts of the rig house that we're finding these flavors. It's not different barrels. We're not doing different distillates or mash bills. Every one of these rye barrels are meant, they're treated the same. It's just naturally occurring differences and discrepancies with natural occur within the flavor profile. Yeah. Um, in large brands, when you dump two or 300 of these together for their small batch, a lot of those flavors just kind of get washed in with the norm. Uh, but when you actually go through and you taste every single barrel, you find these unicorns. That rye sugary, uh, yeah, that rum sugary sweetness to it on the finish is incredible. Yeah, and so it when I was going through it, it was almost as if it were like a barrel, uh, like a rum barrel finish, finish yeah. or something. Yeah, but it, so. yeah. not the yeah. case. It's it, just a straight. It, it, it tastes like it could be finished. It's that sweet. Boy, and you get this like nice like tobacco it's note there in it too. Is this nice? Getting like a chocolate rum ball type. Yeah, aspect. it, it yeah. is it very is finished. Really good. It's very. It, it does have that rum finish to it. That's really unique. Yeah, uh, that is I very love different. This <laughs> and you know, that's one of the other amazing things, like you had mentioned before, where where you're not doing anything with this. No, you know, this is there. These are just sitting in different areas of a of a rick house or the you know the the storage area, and it produces these different unique you know flavors. That's, that's and again, cool. each sip, the, the the sweetness and the flavor yeah. is starting to evolve. I'm starting to pick up yeah. different little nuances yeah. with each sip. It's yeah, it's got again it. It has some tenderness. It has some similarities. Mm-hmm. Uh, it obviously has a ton of sweetness. It. Um, have you ever had uh, like a barrel finished rum, mm-hmm. like rum itself, where it has like that deep like molasses, yes. clove, mm-hmm. yeah, over ripened fruit. Um, yeah, uh, on the uh, side of the bottle, I actually wrote one of the pr- primary tasting notes is like flambéed brown sugar because mm, yeah. you know it's like oh. burnt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, with the like, like you yeah. said before, where you get on top yeah. of the creme brulee. Yes, yeah. so it is. Yeah, yes. brown sugar notes. It is. It is that heavy, heavy, it brown, is heavy sugar. brown sugar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not bright sugar. It's not like vanilla. It's not yeah. cream. It's like clove and just Very, dark yeah, and earthy uh, sweetness. Man, that is fantastic. Yeah, but you still get aspects of your small batch in there. Yeah, mm-hmm. even though. Yeah, yeah. It's and the, the original way 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 back the og single barrel picks that we did <laughs> i actually specified ones that uh, i'd send three to the front of the house that would mingle together to make the small batch now uh, i was somewhat locked in because i wanted it to only be from one portion of the flavor wheel and is a little bit too rigid mm-hmm. because you you can't tell me any of the two that we've tasted so far could you could define as one part of the flavor wheel yeah no because they just hit, they it's, hit all around. It's, it's all over the place, and each, like I said, each sip, it's it goes to different parts of that. It's just different which waves. Like, it does. It yeah. just continues to develop as mm. as it sits there. Yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. That's the all one right. thing I just I love where that sits right on that mid to the back of the palate. Nice spice, chocolate. This <clears throat> more chocolate starts to come out in this as well. Had, my last sip I just had was a was a chocolate, a sweet chocolate, maybe yeah. like chocolate waste with some. Some burnt brown that sugar. Burnt sugar, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very, uh, that's very, very, very interesting. So the last one is actually a double oak. And um, our double, double oak program is uh, when we do a double oak, it's strictly out of necessity. Everything that we've ever released has not been, uh, oh, well, well, we'll just double oak some just because it's a good marketing shtick or mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, we've done it out of necessity to date. So... Uh, what happens, you put whiskey in a barrel, you trust that barrel, you put it in a rick. A year later, you see where it's got a stave that's getting ready to pop out, you're getting ready to lose whiskey, or you've already lost a good amount of the whiskey. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes, it's sometimes it's little wormholes or something that you can drive a peg in, or mm-hmm. uh, it's just a crack, or you know, the barrel swelled. You can work around it 90% of the time, but every now and then you find a barrel that you just can't do anything for. Uh, depending on how you look at it, that whiskey's either really lucky or really unlucky uh, <laughs> to this point. But we're going to go and transfer it into a new barrel uh, and allow it to continue its maturation. 
so double oaking is not a, oh, well, we'll do a quick finish or we'll do this or that or uh, we wait 90 days and then we do that. It's just strictly when we found a barrel that needs swapping, that's when we do it. Okay. Interesting. So, so this uh, is a double oak. So when you're double oaking, how long is it sitting in that second yeah. barrel? Again, there's no prescri- no prescription. No prescription. Really? Yep. So this one, uh, I think it was around a year in the first Damn. barrel and then two years in the second. Wow, two years in the really? second. Really? It's got great color. I yeah, think that was it. Wow. The label downstairs actually has the date differences. It'll probably make me a liar. <laughs> Hopefully not. Well, I trust you. Boy, it's very very dark fruit. Nice little oak there to it. Now this particular selection, I cannot personally take credit for this. Uh, this was actually selected by our single barrel curator, our morning distiller. So it's a combination of uh, actually our evening distiller also. So it was uh, Nick Clee, our morning distiller, Tommy Edwards, our evening distiller, and then John Wadel, who's our single barrel curator. Um, we were kind of behind the eight ball. Uh, we had a selection coming down the pipeline. And they stepped up to the plate, and I think they made a phenomenal selection here. Wow. This is like Snickers bar with fruit and dark, rich raspberry. Yeah. It's amazing on the nose. Yeah, you do get some of that that raspberry, and it's not overpoweringly oaky. No, it's, it's not. not at all. It's not. It's yeah, a, it's, you would it's a you would know you would know that it was it was something. That yeah, when you get that maybe, bitterness, that too yeah. much oak on the nose, you can you could definitely smell it. Mm. Mm. Boy, did that like mellow it right out, like yeah. nice and. Like, I, I know people don't like this term smooth, but it's a good descriptor. I mean, it really is. But mm-hmm. it does, but it takes. It, but it's, if you don't like the term smooth, say anti-harsh. I don't know. Anti-harsh. Yeah. 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 How, how do you describe it? But for yeah. smooth. Yeah. 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 It and, 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 right and there's down. and there's like no no like real heat or anything to it. I mean, it's very like like pleasant. Like right away, you're you're not you know trying to fight anything. But you still. So the oaks that come through. Um, it's to me. This is a double oak. It doesn't come through as as sweet as three. No, it totally doesn't yep. uh, come through overly floral or herbaceous like two. It's very much anchored in dark fruit. Yeah. Um, this one is more of that caramelized sugar, mm-hmm. uh, more like actual caramel caramel. But again, not very, not as strong as three. This is probably the most vanilla heavy that I've gotten out. Exactly. Of it. Yeah. Vanilla heavy, the dark fruit. Um, yeah, you start to get a little bit of that, that kind of that, that creme brulee, you know, that toasted. Yeah, but, <clears throat> but the yeah, the, oak, the oak influence is, is perfect. And yeah. it is it is yeah. not overly done, as you said. It's not it's not to the point where it's starting to get that bitter oak flavor. It has kind of, kind of, of it has a very sweet smokiness. It, it does. Very, yeah. And anytime uh, for whatever reason, every time I get like sweet smokiness complex with it does have just a hint of like a citrus zest to it yeah. just a hint i'm getting it on, you the, know, on the end which and so it, it, it almost creates like a barbecue sauce effect yeah. for me. like it like burnt barbecue sauce oh, like that's when a, you that's first put it yeah. when you first put it on the grill yeah, yeah the kind yeah. of that character you know what it kind of reminds me of when you did the smoked old fashioned it's a l- little bit little i can bit see of, that a little bit along the lines of that Oh man! If the smoked old fashioned were served in a cigar bar, yeah, I can yeah. I can definitely see that. Yeah, yeah, smoke, you know, yeah, smoke squared. Nice. Yeah, even on the uh, even on the nose and after a couple sips, you could you could smell the smoke a little bit coming out here. It's that's delicious, man. All three of these. Yeah, and again, they have notes and they have semblances to the small batch, mm-hmm. but you could serve any of these beside one another against a small batch, yeah. and have a unique experience. So right. some products you'll see a uh, single world beside a small batch and they taste the same. It's an over-curation. Um, we wanted to curate it to the point where we force you to have these fun and interesting aspects to where people like us can geek out on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm geeking out. I'm already trying to figure out which... Do I walk out of here with all three? I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, you have, so... a favorite, you have a favorite, Scott, of the three? Boy, I'll tell you what. I mean, I... This is where it gets interesting. This is really, it's really a different, I mean, you... Because, <laughs> yes, if you're grading for, like, you can grade for, like, maybe technically what is the strongest across the nose. That yeah. if, if you're feeling like a box check sheet, yeah, yeah. you can figure out that. But yeah. regardless of quality, you just gravitate toward favorites. Yeah. It may not be the best. It may not be the worst. It just... It, and it's so subjective, too, because you can... Yeah, you, yeah. And yeah. also, you can get in a mood where I'll... 
Yeah. It's like, do I want what I like best, or do I want something that's so unique and different yeah. that yeah, I yeah. want to enjoy? Yeah. yeah. Like, if, if I don't think at any point in the day you would say, okay, three is like, oh yeah, it's a rye drinker's rye. Like, yeah. rye, rye no. people, no, no. It, no, like that's no. so far out in left field. But I love it yeah. for those it, reasons. It, it, I would say, like, if I was picking my the rye tie is probably where I'd go. Just because of the the uniqueness of it, the character that it that it has. I love that oh rye tie. Yeah. Have you smelled it since it opened up a little bit more? <laughs> I'm not a germaphobe. You can go ahead and taste. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's got more of a rum characteristic. Yeah, to it really. It's gotten does. stronger. It really yes. Does. So I don't think there's a day of the week where you would say rye tie is, uh, oh yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a phenomenal rye. I mean, it's yeah. a phenomenal product that happens to be a rye. Yeah. But, wow. and, that, and that's where our single barrel program just gets so fun. Yeah, it's, man. That's, that's the one thing. I mean, I, I do taste a lot of, you know, craft whiskeys as well. And when you start getting those different and unique profiles that a lot of them have, you like learn to appreciate something that's different and unique just from mm -hmm. tasting so many of those things. But yeah, I mean, it probably would be my favorite. I mean, I, I would take any of them any day. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I think depending on what you're in the mood for, they all offer something that's so different and unique that if you want something that leans a particular way, you kind of have a whole smorgasbord of what you yeah would really want yeah so. all three of them are absolutely yeah they're all different unique yeah. they're all amazing quality stellar flavors it's just yeah there's really no wrong answer honestly so what's uh something that we do here occasionally when we have special events or things coming up mm -hmm. uh we'll do a program where we have a little private uh evening tour sometimes where we'll let a group come in and actually play a role in the selection of the next single barrel to go up front here and so you've got 20 people or greater uh, coming in they go through on a tour and at the end uh, instead of tasting the products that we have available currently we let them go ahead and figure out which one is going to come up front next so mm. you've got 20 personalities in the room and they're getting samples as different as this yeah it's like herding cats yeah, <laughs> no, I, cause, yeah. I mean because and when we first tried doing it we tried polling the whole audience and it's like they're looking to see who's voting for what, and they're uh, they're trying to shift opinions based on that yeah. because uh, for, yeah. no matter what, everyone wants to vote for the winner. Yeah. Um, so we uh, the most recent one we did, uh, we broke it up and we went table by table and kind of talked to them. And so we went to I, the first table I went to. They're like, we liked two and four the best. Uh, well, if you have to lean away, which one would it be? And they were split right down the middle. No. You go to the next table. Well, we liked three. All of you, yes. <laughs> then you know the next table. Like at the end of it, it was like there, there no it, decision was ever really made. It was like, no, no. It, there, it was like thin margin, like yeah. like borderline. We need a recount <laughs> yeah. or a yeah. blind ballot yeah. box yeah. or something. But yeah. at, at, heck, even downstairs in the tasting room. Um, you have people just arguing with each other and it's it's hilarious it's it's fun to watch <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, because it, it's it's all about how good the product is if they were arguing about bad stuff I've, that, I've that seen, wouldn't be nearly I've, as fun I've, I've seen some arguments and some barrel yeah. picks it does get a little bit crazy and yes. I, I think it's i think it's very natural for when you taste something and you like it to try to sway the other people yes. you know, in your direction and that's so, the other thing about group tasting is you do get people sway trying to sway you, each other yeah so. it becomes very yeah. you know influential yeah. so it, it really it really does what's so. your favorite out of the three yeah all oh, the uh, my tie hands down but that double oak, a, that we, double we, oak, we went punny with it i'm rye sorry tie. rye tie but yes, the, yes. but the uh, the double oak made a run yes it really it really that, did i mean they were that's all, all that has me uh yeah every time i go back to that it got better each sip. Yeah. And again, I think these are those ones that as they sit and open up and you take your time with them a little bit, you start to really get a lot of different things that, that come out. So that's why. I like, noticed that you're running a little low on small batch. Thanks, man. I had no problem. I appreciate it. Hey, for mm -hmm. the team. For the yeah. team. Take one yeah. for the team. Well. But just go back to it and see that, in fact, everything that you've tasted and you've appreciated out of these other ones it's there. 
there's still the there's still the small batch aspect in all of these. Yes. Yeah. And and that's what and from the beginning when we sat down and talked, that's what you said you wanted to. Yeah. You wanted to kind of thread that needle through all of the different single barrels and yeah. the quality, and you could taste it. It becomes a very good balance of of all of these things that you kind of put together that intermingle in that. Yeah, it's a very yeah. very consistent. Oh, product. It's incredible, man. It really it really is. Caleb, I can't thank you enough for doing this and sitting down with us. This is nice. absolutely this has been amazing. Yeah. Oh, I like I said. My goal here, um, and, and I, I say this when I, on the rare occasion when I do have to go out into the uh, marketplace and talk with different uh, bar owners or store managers and everything, it's not a high pressure sale. I'm here to educate. I, yeah. I want to help people. I want people to understand uh, what they're getting themselves. They're, when they walk to the shelf, I want them to be able to look with a little bit more knowledge than when I talked to them before. Um, whether you buy perils, whether you don't buy perils, that's your decision. Uh, I, I just want to help people have good experiences, and that's why I love talking with people like you all. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, when it comes to experience, you guys are from from A to Z. You're uh, you're, you're providing that, and uh, I can't really wait. I cannot wait to taste your bourbon. Yeah, and, yes. Uh, and, and we didn't uh, even really talk about that. We, we we've yeah, got yeah. bourbon I mean, if, coming out. Yeah, yeah. Bourbon I mean, if, you, if you don't out. mind, do you can you want can you, are you able to share anything about the bourbon? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, you don't have to. If I mean, that's yeah. fine if you, if you don't yeah. want to. That's, so. Uh, you know, I'll give you a snapshot as far as where we're at right now. Okay. okay. I've already uh, made probably 80% of the selections that are going to be going into that first batch. Okay. Um, it's uh, it's going to be difficult to, or first batches, uh, first couple totes. Um, it's difficult right now for me to figure out where exactly it's going to come together and what notes are going to shine through. Uh, similar to the rye, I have a good idea of where I think it's going to land. Uh, I'm really happy with where it's going to land based on what I've tasted. But uh, until I get that final mingle, I won't actually be able to do a formal set of tasting notes that say, uh, in contrast to rye, it's going to be more floral. I do expect it to be more floral. Yeah. I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Um, I expect cinnamon to be uh, played up a little bit more. Uh, the fact that you don't have the rye spice uh, kind of taking over the spice category, I expect the oak spice to be the dominant leader there. Mm -hmm. um, I actually am still getting quite a bit of grassiness out of the rye and the limited ones I've tasted, so it's going to be a it, it's going to be a peerless product. Yeah, it's uh, the same level of thought and precision that went into a rye you can expect out of a bourbon. So, so it's a bourbon with the peerless DNA built into it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I think a lot of people will be looking for it. I mean, you you kind of set the yeah. tone with all your mm -hmm. ryes. I think a lot of people will be super excited for the for the bourbon and and, and yeah. rightfully so yeah you know you should be proud of so that. yeah we uh, we release on june 22nd less than a month out um come check us out if you're coming sometime that next week or uh, anytime in those following weeks we do anticipate there may be being a shortage uh so feel free to call the front of the building uh you can google us and find that information because i don't know it off the top of my head <laughs> to, to yeah. be frank um, you did say you're not a marketing guy so uh, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, i i uh, <laughs> i well like we said i was uh, uh hitting print on a barrel process uh <laughs> like 30 seconds before i came up here for this interview so it's uh i'm not a uh I, i'm a distiller's distiller i'm not a uh, marketer's distiller <laughs> No, we like we like talking to distillers. Yeah, we we, 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 we you, you're the really ones that educate us and our audience. So yeah, we really appreciate it. We really we really do it. And thank you again for for taking the time and you know educating us and and everybody else at, at home. So, uh, like I say, it's about the journey and not the destination, Jason. And like I say, uh, it's not about the whiskey; it's the people you share it with. So, cheers, guys. Cheers. I don't have a catchphrase, <laughs> but thank you all for tuning in and uh, checking these guys out and let me kind of slum around with them too. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.